We have been in the REACH series, just been amazing, just so encouraging and so challenging as well, just hearing people's stories of their yeses to the Lord. And um, we do reach the culmination of REACH uh, 24 in terms of announcements. You've got one of these brochures. Um, this looks at uh, what our REACH vision is all about, extending our REACH to REACH the lost. It looks at how we are gonna do that by creating spaces and places for people to encounter Jesus. Um, in here is a kind of what the Lord has done for us so far this past couple of years. There's some wonderful testimonies in here. And it also looks at the new spaces and places that we will be doing this year that I've announced. Uh, and so um, take this away with you, uh, information there. Also, you can go to verso.church forward slash reach with information there, and you can indeed download the brochure um, from that webpage as well. <clears throat> Last week, I brought a word um, that looked at how we use our members, our body parts essentially, uh, for acts of righteousness. Um, and I said to you that it was set in a theme, uh, an introduction for, for a fuller message that would be today. And that's what I want to do today as I end Reach 24. Let me ask you a question. Anybody been walking down the road, looking at their phone, Google Maps or something, um, and all of a sudden it says that it needs to recalibrate. Anyone kind of got that? And it says you have to do this weird, do you know what I'm, am I just being, do you know what I mean, right? Encourage the pastor. Yeah, you kind of do this weird thing, so you've got people doing this in the middle of the street, you know, like I had to do this recently. And why do you need to do that? Because I guess Google Maps decides after a period of time or any other map of your choice that um, you're slightly out, you know, and so while it's not massively obvious, if you keep walking in that direction, you'll find that you've kind of veered off. And so I believe that the word that the Lord has given me this morning for us as a body of people is a word of recalibration. Uh, it's a corrective word. It's a word um, that ensures that we are on the right direction. Now, you might look at your life and think, well, it's, it's hunky-dory, or maybe you don't, I'm not sure, but... We only need to be off slightly in terms of how we think things through to find that we end up in a very different location that we wanted to. And so I want us to do a bit of a recalibration exercise. I'm not gonna ask you to wave your hands in the air, you'll be pleased to know. But I am gonna ask you a question to start this off. Are you ready for your first step in your recalibration? Yes, Pastor. Thank you. What is guiding you? Uh, more specifically, what values help you prioritize the decisions that you make? I'll put it another way. What are you reaching for? What are you reaching for? Now, we all reach for something, don't we? I mean, many of them are good things, aren't they? Um, I mean, maybe you're reaching for a qualification, you're in sixth form and you're working on a particular qualification, that's a very good thing. Uh, maybe you, uh, you know, you're reaching for a promotion. Maybe you've got your sights on that. Maybe uh, you're reaching for an extension on your house or, or a new car on your drive. You know, in and amongst themselves, these are not bad things. Maybe you're reaching for retirement and uh, you're looking at how you can make it as comfortable as possible. And I'm sure there's other things that you've got in your mind that you're reaching for. And as I said, these... These are not bad things, are they? These are good things. But let me ask you a question, is that it? And is that the primary thing that you're reaching for? Are they the most important things that you're reaching for? And most importantly, is that what God is calling you to reach for? Is that in your equation? Is that in your thinking? What I'd like us to do today is to read a portion of scripture that we find in a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 3, and it's verses 10 to 15. It'll be on the screen here. And if you uh, have a device, it'll be on your device as well. I'd like us to read this, and then we're gonna unpack this together as part of our recalibration exercise that we are undertaking. Let me find verse 10. Are you ready? According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, 
precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but as only through fire. Amen. <clears throat> what does this word mean? There's a lot to unpack here. Here the Apostle Paul is talking primarily about the issue of doctrine in the, in the church. And he was addressing the doctrine as it relates to how it is being taught. He was saying, hey, your focus should be on building upon the truth of that which J Jesus has already laid down. There's a whole sermon there about the church wanting to come up with brand new, unique revelation that's outside of the scriptures. But I won't go there. He was saying, listen, Jesus has laid down the foundations and we need to build upon that truth. Anything else he's saying is just hay. Now what happens when fire comes in hay? It burns up. It is a warning to those that teach and uh, no one, as it says in scripture, should rush to teach. You are held more responsible. But here's the other dynamic of this word, which is we are all building God's kingdom, are we not? I mean, reach is about extending our kingdom to reach the lost. It is recognizing that each one of us has a part to play in the great commission to make disciples of every nation, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so this warning does take that other dynamic. Now it says here, and I'm gonna unpack this as we go, that the day will disclose your works. What does that mean, the day will disclose it? It is the day that we stand before Christ and all of our works will be judged. Now, the judgment of the believer, you and I in Christ Jesus, if you profess a faith in Christ, is different than the judgment of those that do not believe in Christ. I think many Christians are confused about what kind of judgments occur at the end. Do I get judged, do I not? Do they get judged, how do they get judged? What happens? And you know, I think that's a fair confusion because it can be a bit tricky and there's not much teaching on it. And there are normally two main points of view from Christians around the judgment that we read about. Number one, it's this. As believers, we won't be judged at all. That's, the, that's number one view. We said yes to Christ. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And so the judgment of God, which was supposed to be for you and I, the penalty of, of sin, that wrath, Jesus took on the cross. And therefore, it doesn't matter what we do. We have our ticket to heaven. And thank you very much. But that view is not entirely correct. There is a second view, which is this. Even though we have said yes to Jesus Christ and he died on the cross and he said it is finished, we will still be judged for our works to earn our place in heaven. And once again, that view is not entirely correct. And in fact, that view was what led to the Reformation. You see, Martin Luther in 1500 and something, he was reading his Bible and he realized that the teaching of the Catholic Church was that faith plus works. And he wrote in the margin of his Bible, solas, which is the Latin word for alone. And the revelation, the way he, the Holy Spirit enabled him to see the word was that it is in faith alone that we are saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. And we often talk about the Reformation as the five solos of, solos of the Reformation. Solo Scriptura, which means by Scripture alone. Solos Christos, Christ alone. Solo Fide, faith alone. Solo Gratia, grace alone. And Sola Dia Gloria, glory to God alone. 
We are Protestants. We are, believe on the five solos of the Reformation. It is in faith alone that we are saved. It's Jesus plus nothing. But you see, that seeps in into the way in which we live our lives. But this is what I want to say. Whilst our works will be judged, they won't form the basis of merit to be saved. So what is the correct view then, Mark? Glad you asked me that question. It is this, are you ready? <laughs> you are not saved by your works, but by faith in Christ alone. Therefore, your salvation is secured and you won't be judged whether you deserve to be in heaven. But you will be judged for your works, which will determine your rewards and your role there. That is the truth of Scripture. What we need to understand is that the Bible speaks of two different types of judgment, having established what is the correct view, that we will not be judged to whether or not we earn our place in heaven, that was we are saved, we don't have that judgment, our works will be judged. So let's unpack this further. Are you with me? Are you tracking? There are two judgments that we read about in the Bible. The first is the great white throne of judgment. And when I say first, I don't mean in order. I'm just the first of the list that I have for you. The judgment is for non-believers, those that do not profess a faith in Christ Jesus. The great white throne of judgment we read about in Revelation chapter 20, 11 to 15. If you wanna make a note of that scripture, you can follow up and read that. And this happens after the literal thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna give you a very, very brief timeline. I've done it before, but here we go again. We're in what's called the church age, the age of grace. There will come a time when the church will be taken out, rapture, or rapturo, harpozo, to meet the Lord in the air for the seven-year marriage supper of the Lamb. And then there will be the seven-year tribulation where it is the wrath of God upon this world. Why? So people will turn to Christ and, and God's um, eyes turn back onto Israel to save Israel. You can read that in Romans. And there is what's called during that period tribulation saints. These are people that believe in Jesus during that period. At the end of the seven years, Jesus comes again with the bride, that's us, and then he will establish the thousand year literal reign of Christ, the millennial reign. And then, and then during that period, the devil is tied up into the abyss. And at the end of that, he's let out, there's, then there's Armageddon, you've heard about that war. And then there'll be the great white throne of judgment. Okay, that's a brief overview, but that's how it looks, okay? Now there are different views across the Christian world in terms of how these things fit. But um, this is a very, very common, well scholarly read position that the church has had since the early church fathers. And so the great white throne of judgment occurs after that seven years. And that is where people will be judged. And it's once said that if you're born once, you'll die twice. When you die here and then the second judgment. If you're born twice, you'll only die once. If you're born of the flesh and you're born of the spirit, you'll only die once and then you have your resurrected body. I know this is heavy stuff, hey, but it's good, right? Let's preach the word. So that is that. And we don't want people to go to that one, do we? That's why we need to have a sense of urgency. Number two, the judgment seat of Christ. This is for the believers, Okay. Let's read this in 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all be appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He's speaking to the believers so that each of us, you and me, may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body. Now, whether good or bad, are you seeing that? Now, it's often called the beamer seat of Christ. The beamer seat was a, a seat they had um, during the Olympic Games way back in the Greeks. And it was where you went to get your rewards. And this is what that judgment is for. And so when we get raptured, the dead in Christ will be risen first, have their resurrected bodies, and then we who are alive and remain will be taken up at the same time to meet the Lord in the air. That's when we get our resurrected bodies. I can't wait, hallelujah. Then we are in the beam of seat of Christ, okay? 
It says in John 9, 4, 5, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, while it is now, the church age, the age of grace. Night is coming, the great and terrible day of the Lord when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world, Jesus says. So they're the two judges. Does that help explain? As Christians, we are not judged for salvation. Jesus has done it all on the cross, but we will face Jesus at the beam of seat of Christ and our works will be judged and we will be rewarded accordingly. Now, I'd like to give you a visual aid to explain this. And uh, can I have this rope, please? Thank you. I rarely, if ever, use visual aids. Thank you very much. But I saw Francis Chan do this. And hey, he's, he's, we love Francis Chan. Um, He's part of the SEND uh, initiative, which is great. We'll speak more about that at church. But um, I thought if, if it's good enough, I mean, he did a great job. So I'm just going to copy him. So anyone online, credit to Francis Chan. I'm not saying it's me. Right. Let's, let's see this rope. How long is this rope? Really long, isn't it? Look at that. Who wants to get the other end? Thank you. Thank you, Steph, my wife. Let's see how long this is. I mean, it's pretty long, isn't it? How long we, yeah, it's very long. Let's get it on the stage. Right, now, this is a long rope. Thank you. Now, I want you to imagine that this rope is your life. Right? This rope represents millions upon millions of, life, uh, of years. In fact, more than millions, eternity. Because did you know that eternity is written in your heart? You are an eternal being, right? That's the reality. So this is your life. Very long, isn't it? Now, I want you to look at this. This, this little teeny bit is your life here on earth. Are we getting this, people? This is now. Now, how do we live? Oh, I'm here. I've got to reach for a few years, and then I can have an amazing life there. If I just reach a little bit, I'll, I'll get myself a brand new car, and it'll be all good. If I reach a little bit, man, I'm going to have so much comfort. That's how we live our lives. So I live my life most of the time. Now, I feel challenged to say, listen, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to work so that for this bit. I'm going to reach there. I don't want to reach here. Because I'm going to, it says in James, our life is just but a vapor. Listen, people will say to me, Mark, you're crazy. The sacrifices you make for ministry, you know, you know, you could have been this, you could have done that, blah, 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 blah. What are you doing it for? I'm doing it for this. You think I'm crazy? I think you're crazy. I mean, seriously. What are you reaching for? Are you reaching in here or are you reaching for this? Because I've got to be honest with you, our re we need some recalibration. Because we've set our, our hearts on living for the temporal when God is calling us to live for the eternal. You know, and that's the message this morning. The question is, what are you reaching for? Because God is calling us to live in the light of eternity. That is what is at stake. You know, my heart for you, just it, it seriously, is that you would live your life not for this life, but for the glory of God and for the next life. There are too many easy listening sermons and books about how you live your best life now. Too many preachers focusing on five steps to prosperity. I'm sick and tired of it. Because they're just getting you to reach in this little bit. Have the comfort, have the enjoyment. Don't sacrifice, you don't need to. You don't have enough, probably because you don't have enough faith. Sick and tired of it, to be honest with you. Where, where is the knowledge that we are living in the light of eternity? Where is the knowledge that we are here to do the works of Christ who sent us? Where is, where is the acknowledgement that Jesus says, you will have trials and troubles. You will be persecuted for my name. But there is a reward for you. What does the Apostle Paul say? I count all this nothing compared with the glory that's going to be revealed. How often do we say that to ourselves? By the way, I'm preaching to myself, so I'm glad you can join me. Oof. I want to tell you this, listen. I've had much, quote, success in my life. I've built companies, I've sold some. I've made millions of pounds. I've spent millions of pounds. I've made investors 
very wealthy. I've had the trappings of a lifestyle where I've had the world's version of success. But for me, a large portion of that was just a ton of hay. Now, I don't want to minimize, hear my heart, God calls many of you to generate wealth for the kingdom. He wants our businesses to be successful and be kingdom businesses. But we do so in the light of eternity, not in the light of the temporal. That is the difference. If you want a, a kingdom biblical uh, theology on works, then you can only talk about that in the context of eternity. But I was out of whack. My focus was on reaching on that little bit there, not in eternity. And there was a time when I started my first company that I sold, and we had just, this is in Australia, we had raised millions of dollars on a, a capital raise. And I was often in the tech press being interviewed and people would look to me as success and people would reach out to me and say, wow, that's amazing, I wanna hear from you, can you, invert, can you, you know, advise us, blah, 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 blah. But deep down, I have to say, I was unhappy. There was a holy discomfort in me that what I was doing wasn't ultimately what God had for me and I was not living my life in the light of eternity. I was reaching not for the glory of God and for his extension of his kingdom, but I was reaching for the extension of my comfort zone. And the call on my life to be in his ministry was stirred, and his ministry was stirred once again. I remember, guys, I was in these fancy offices in Sydney, and at lunchtime, I would squirrel out of that office. Some of you, have, you've heard this story before. And I would go into this local Presbyterian church, bless that church that had their doors open, and I would go there in lunchtime, and I would quote Psalm 84, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my Lord than dwell in the tent of the wicked. And I petitioned the Lord and said, Lord, I don't want to keep doing this. I've tasted and it's tasteless. I've experienced and I'm left empty. I've reached what I thought I needed and I've discovered that it ain't enough. Can I tell you something else? Uh, occasionally people say to me, I wish we could be like the church in Acts. Anyone had these kind of conversations? Pastor, calm down. <clears throat> you know, and it's true. We want to be like that church. They see God move, and rightly so. It's a good conversation. We want to experience those miracles, et cetera, et cetera. And I would agree. But then they would say, and I've said this before, and so what we need to do, therefore, is go back to the same model of church. Big churches don't work. What we need is small little house groups. That's, that's why God moved. That's the only way. God doesn't show up in big churches, apparently. And when you hear it, you, 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 know, you find yourself thinking, oh, maybe there's something in that. Maybe we need to be in small little house groups. But the more time I've been thinking about it, the more I think it misses out the key reason, and it's this. Those early church, those early Christians were living in the light of eternity. That's the difference. They had an expectation that Jesus was about to come any moment. We have completely and utterly lost it. You see, they weren't reaching for this world. They were reaching out for his kingdom. If we want a church like the Acts, then we better stop reaching for this world. We better start reaching for his kingdom. We have become fat and lazy the Western church. And I put my hand up and say, you can count me in that. Now, I'm not saying we should all go sell ourselves and be poor. That's not what the scripture says. It's about a heart attitude. What are we reaching for? What is our priority? What is our focus? Listen, God does want us to enjoy good things. He wants us to enjoy his blessings. But that is a result of being with him. It's not the main reason and the main focus. And so, you know, if we want the church to be like the church of Acts, then we better start reaching like the church for Acts did. Who's gonna spend themselves for the life to come and for the glory of God? Hmm? Versus spending themselves on the little bit of the life now and glory of their own name. So I wanna ask you a question. We're almost at the end of this recalibration. I know it's been a little bit painful maybe. See, listen, church, I wanna, when we talk about reach, it isn't just about the programs and the initiatives that the church puts together. 
It's much deeper than that. It's about the vision of the type of people we want to be. This is what this is about. This has eternal consequences. And it is with so the realization that you and me one day are gonna stand in front of Jesus Christ who has a heart to reward us and bless us and every work that we have done, whether good or bad in the body, will be judged by Christ. And we, you and I, will have to give account of that. And the question will be, what were you reaching for? Were you reaching for me? Were you reaching for my kingdom? Were you reaching for others? You know, I said at the start that reach has a dual purpose, our, our 10-year plan. It's, of course, the outward focus is to create spaces and places where people can encounter Jesus because we know that when people encounter Jesus, lives are transformed. But it is also a discipleship program that God has tailor-made for us, a framework for every one of us to get involved in. Since I've been speaking on reach, I've had other people come to me with ideas saying, you know, Mark, I just feel the Lord's calling me to this. I'm like, great, go ahead and do it. Like, this is not just about you sit there and watch what we're doing and say, well done, that's amazing. This is about me encouraging all of us to say, what am I reaching for and what part can I play in this? Some of it will be in this. I believe that some of you here are called to go with Verso Hemel and to sacrifice for those that yet to know Jesus. I believe it's the same for Verso Luton. I believe for Verso Hatfield that some of you have, well, I love the big church experience. What if you said, Lord, I'm gonna give you two years and I'm gonna see what you can do through me. I'm gonna sacrifice that which I seem to like to go in kingdom work. You know, we need to think like that and I need to think like that as well. I'm, I'm challenged by this word because I don't live for that long piece of rope most of the time. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Time, energy and money. What are you spending your time on? Are you spending it on blessing others and, and creating a, a place and a space where you can invite people around for dinner maybe or food or just go meet them in the park or just call them and say, how are you feeling at the moment? What are you using your energy? Are you, are you using it to pray for people in your quiet hours? Are you open to the Spirit of God to intercede for people when He wakes you up at two in the morning and you wonder why you're awake? And what are you using your money? Tool is the bit, you know, money is a massive tool that we can use. If the Christian church all gave 10%, this world would look different. Did you know that? Imagine what would happen if we gave more than 10%. Imagine if we said, Lord God, I'm gonna use my money in the light of eternity. Imagine how this world would be different. We are raising money for reach. We do this every year and I don't wanna labor the point. We're raising 180,000 this year. Now you might think that's a lot of money and of course it is. You know, on our books quote, there's about 2,200 members. You don't see them here every Sunday, not everyone comes every Sunday. I've done some maths. That works out at 70 pounds a person per, for one year. Divide that by 12, that's six pounds a month. If everyone gave six pounds a month, we will be able to fund Verso Luton, Verso Hemel, Verso Central. I believe that some are called to go right into the city of St. Albans. And later in this year, as Peter and the team build out that plan, we're gonna have a Q&A session for that as well, for the exciting plans that God has laid on our heart for that. Uh, you know, we're gonna to continue to fund Verso Hatfield. We're going to continue to do all the amazing things with mission and other things, but that includes each one of us pay, taking our part in that. And so I want to ask you to speak to the Lord and say, Lord, how can I be in part of that with my time, my energy and my money? Maybe you need to sacrifice one coffee a week and just have a jar and put the money in there. Some of you aren't gonna be able to give. It's not about equal giving, it's about equal sacrifice. We are a generous church, church. Look what we have done in His name over the past 37 years as we've responded to the call to reach out beyond ourselves. And so I would ask you please just pray about how you can use your time, energy, and money. And for the money section, there is this form at the back. There's an opportunity to say, I pledge so much a month or for the year. 
or you want to give a one-off gift. I think some of you here, and I've spoken to some of you, you're saying, Mark, the Lord has blessed me with wealth, blessed me with the ability to make wealth, and I want to be able to be a part of building the kingdom. If you feel a particular gifting in that area, I'd like you to email me. Um, I believe that God is stirring in my heart to, um, to later this year, invite people that feel called in that way to have a conversation about what could it look like? What could that look like? With that, I'd like us to stand as I end.